Good morning. My name is Rachel Jewett, and I'm here for a Thursday morning conversation with Spire CEO Peter Platzer. Spire has been named one of Via Satellite's 10 hottest companies for 2021, so we're excited to speak with Peter today. Um, Spire is a remote sensing company that collects RF data through its network of about 100 small satellites, and it also offers satellite as a service for customers. So Peter, congrats on making this year's 10 hottest companies. It's a great honor. We're really, really excited looking at the, at the other companies that you had in the past and you have this year. It really is a very, very illustrious group. And so being, uh, being selected to be part of it is something that definitely got us all very, very excited in the office. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's a list that we're excited to put out. And we spend a lot of time and energy, you know, putting it together. And we can't select, you know, we we have to come up with a new group each year. And it's great that there are so many amazing companies in the space industry that we still have so many options and that it's like, okay, this company or this company, who's gonna make the list this year? Yeah, I can I can only imagine with the with the explosion of interest and companies and ideas that are being created every single year, almost every single month, I, I wanna say, uh, that, uh, that your job in a sense gets easier, but also harder every single year. And definitely, for sure, it is getting more interesting. Yes, so much activity in the space sector. So I want to go back with Spire, and I want to go back to the beginning. So when Spire was founded, what was the vision and the story behind it? So maybe I take like even one step further back, because I think it's going to okay. help to like see why that vision was created. Right. So I have been fascinated with space and using that ultimate high ground to collect data to solve problems here on earth ever since i was i was a physicist you know I, my, my first graduate degree is in physics and i spent some time in research institutions and and was was an armored with this idea but it was this very slow and crusted you know industry and so it didn't really quite fit you know, my personality and what I wanted to do. So mm -hmm. I've been uh, uh, writing code since I'm a teenager. And so I've followed that track a little bit. I then worked for the Boston Consulting Group in Europe and in Asia. And then they sent me to Harvard Business School. And there I looked at the space industry again. I even read this, mm -hmm. um, uh, read this wonderful book uh, from Laurie Beth Jones, which helps you come up with a mission statement for your life which for me came out to you know, uh, lead, inspire, and create the business of space um, for the benefit of all. But the industry was still so slow. And it wasn't until a decade later through an event at NASA Ames, um, and then uh, that led me to get my last graduate degree in space science and management in France, where the industry was at this um, uh, starting point of, mm. of massive change. Uh, and there I met my two, my two co-founders and really that idea of collecting data from space to solve problems on earth uh, got, got refined more. You know, we, we called it, we want to collect data which can only be captured from a large satellite constellation in space mm -hmm. to solve problems on earth. And we had like a few other um, uh, criteria that we're defining our business model from day one. And I'm happy to talk about them at the later point in time, but that's kind of like the story arc that led us to building the world's largest multi-purpose satellite constellation, collecting data 24 seven day and night in all weather conditions to solve problems on Earth. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, you're one of the earlier new space companies to have a fully deployed constellation so what was that like pushing a business case with small satellite when small satellites weren't the standard um your question shows a great deal of insight into the trials and tribulations and pain <laughs> that people that do something early on go through um and i wasn't you know i was one of the earlier ones but you know credit where yeah. credit is due i was not the first okay. one um, but it, it was definitely, it was an interesting period. I think I got a lot of solace out of having been part, at least as, a, as an observer, the transfer of the transformation from mainframe computers to personal computers, right? Where people with power um, went on stage and said, there's a world market of three computers, 
right? And, you know, similarly in this industry, we had people going on stage and says like, cube sets are toys, right? Um, so I knew the parallels and they kind of like, uh, let me um, not despair. And again, always come back to the facts, always come back to the data. What fueled the, the transformation from mainframes to personal computers was at the very, very heart of it, Moore's Law. The performance improvements of, of computing devices as an exponential curve year after year after year. And we started this company based on some research that I had done on the performance improvements of small satellites, not computers, but small satellites. And I had seen in that data a very reliable, steady 10x every five year curve. Mm -hmm. That's about, it's a bit faster than Moore's law, but it's a similar kind of like um, a speed. And by the time I did the research, it was steady for almost 15 years. And today it has now been stable for almost 25 years. So we have this same powerful underlying, you know, um, pattern mm -hmm. that drives capability per kilogram on an exponential path. Very exciting. Um, looking at that, just on that, of the capability increasing even more in the future, um, what are some of the possibilities that you see for small satellites maybe five years from now? So five years, um, Rachel, that's a 10x improvement. That's a lot, right? So yeah. um, I'm always going to be careful looking that far right. out yeah. because I remember um, a computer conference in the late 80s where um, someone was asked a similar question of like, what's the killer application for personal computers? You know, and that poor individual, you know, was sweating profusely trying to answer that. In the end, he said, well, I think it's going to be housewives that want their recipes on the computer. And that's the killer app for personal computers. Well, in hindsight, it's a great joke, um, but it's also a warning for, for the future of like, not try to be too smart and too prescriptive for what will happen five yeah. years out. Let me just maybe take something which is, you know, not five years, but six months, five months, okay. you know, maybe a year yeah. out, right? Um, and there are two big uh, movements that I see um, that we are doing and that others are doing, right? And the first one is computing at the edge, yeah. right? You have this ever more powerful sensors that we now can deploy in space then have um, ever more greater sensitivity, aperture, um, uh, 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 bandwidth, whatever dimension the sensor operates in, they can do more for less, less power, less mm -hmm. space, less weight. Now you still then have the challenge of you need to get this data down to the ground. And that continues to be you know, a bottleneck relative to the data production that is happening. You know, we no. used to produce data in megabits per second and we download in kilobits per second, right? Now, you know, we, we generate data in gigabyte bits per second and we download in megabits per second, right? And so that race continues uh, to go forward. And so people have started to put, you know, exceptional computing power at the edge on those sensor devices. Mm -hmm. So we recently started deploying on our satellites, a, you know, you can almost call it a supercomputer actually. It's somewhere between one and two teraflops of compute power. Wow. 256 GPUs, you know, massive capabilities with regards to AI and machine learning, driving both the autonomous capabilities of those devices but also driving the, uh, the capability to extract the valuable information right there on the spot and then make a decision sending it to the customer. And I think we're gonna continue to see that. And I think that will continue to drive the value that we can bring to customers as an industry, as a company like Spire, um, from data we collect in lower Earth orbit. So that's one, I think, pretty okay. exciting 
um, uh, uh, trend that, that you know, we started to implement. And the other one is um, almost the same thing that happened, you know, mainframe personal computers. What was exciting when we started to network those personal computers um, with the internet, right? That enabled a whole new uh, level of applications. And the same thing is happening now with, you know, those very, very small satellites. So we started to deploy what's in the industry fancily called inter-satellite links. Okay. It's yeah. basically a network, right? It just yeah. connects all those satellites and they can then behave as one um, um, organism, that's called it. Right. And, you know, you start, right. of course, you know, just like we did, you know, you start off with uh, with radio frequencies and, and, and now we are now we are going to uh, to lasers. Right. Okay. And when you start to think that you have like this connected network of a capability that has always a, a, a real time connection to Earth, you know, entirely new applications start to become possible. Those are just two of the things that I see happening and they're happening in like a period of like, you know, months, maybe like a few quarters, uh, definitely with Inspire, but also I think on an industry-wide basis, you're going to start to see those capabilities being deployed more often by those that use space to solve problems on earth. Yeah, I, I know laser links are, uh, are a big focus in the industry right now and the additional capabilities that those will unlock. Um, I didn't know that Spire was exploring laser, so that's very exciting. Yeah, we built that technology just like everything else, you know, in our labs. And mm -hmm. uh, we have a pretty good process now of, uh, of developing new capabilities and then rolling them out to our technology. Um, uh, uh, based on on the you know 140 150 I I forget actually how many satellites yeah. we have launched over the last 30 launch campaigns and so that's that's the last the, the latest piece of technology that that we developed and started to to put on the spacecraft. Awesome, and what does that what options does that unlock when the satellites are able to communicate with each other in space? So, you know, of course it enables um, some communications capabilities. You know, we are of course not a communications company, but you mentioned early on that space as a service model. And so offering customers that, for example, operate in the IoT space or that operate in a, in a search and rescue or in an early warning uh, kind of market, the ability to have a network that covers the whole globe to collect data and then you know figure out what is wrong potentially and then act in a literally de facto real time fashion i mean that is a very very powerful application from small satellites that used to be uh, relocated to billion dollar infrastructures that are also not just expensive to launch and operate but they're also fixed in their capabilities for mm -hmm. often 10 15 yeah. 15 years so those are some of the applications that we have seen. You know, for us, um, uh, what, is, what, is, what is really interesting is um, helping our customers, for example, in the aviation industry, have this much, much lower latency for, for their assets. Interesting. Another aspect of Spire that I wanted to ask about is, I know weather is a big part of the information that you collect is useful for weather. So, you know, what kind of data is that and how are people using it? Why is that important? Um, I know that more severe weather is becoming a bigger and bigger issue with climate change. And I know that that's, you know, tracking weather is really important. So talk to me about um, Spire's work in the weather area. I will never forget the day when I read the first paper about this particular type of technology called GNSS radio occultation um, and recognized that given that 10x every five years, you know, uh, law that I had found in the data, I could project where the capabilities of small satellites could be and that they could uh, deliver this type of data. Weather impacts a third of the global economy and arguably 100% of the world population. Yeah. And it's still this feeling of like the weather is unpredictable. I mean, who hasn't heard or told 
a joke about the weatherman. And yet, the reason why it is such a difficult phenomenon is partially because you need data concurrently from all of Earth. Because what is happening in 24 hours right now here is determined by what is happening, you know, a thousand miles away, that, that you know, proverbial butterfly effect. So to really improve weather prediction, we absolutely need satellites. And we just need more than the you know, small number of satellites that traditionally we had available, which are large, often billion dollar mm -hmm. instruments. You need the capability to capture what is happening all across the earth with like a, a large number of sensors which means it can only be done with a large satellite constellation. And the data that we capture through this uh, method is uh, temperature, pressure, and moisture. And we capture it at, 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 at very, very many levels of the atmosphere all the way down to the ground. And those are the, are the key variables that go into the massive supercomputers that drive weather predictions and mm -hmm. help us understand where we should take a ship to not really risk the cargo or create a smoother flight or how to deal with our crop, where a logistics chain might be interrupted, where there might be a, a construction site being laid uh, uh, to rest because the crane can't operate where the demand for electricity might outstrip the supply because there's so much more air condition that will drive it. A wildfire might be created because it has been so dry and the wind is going in just the wrong direction. Or where um, you don't know how much will I, uh, as a solar power plant or as a wind farm, actually produce an electricity because I don't have the weather information. Where as a city, I, I, you know, I, I want to know, is a hurricane going to hit me? Is there going to be you know, a severe weather event? And all of those elements are just increasing in frequency and increasing in severity. Yeah. And so when we recognize that we can provide uh, the world with uh, an order, two order of magnitude, more data, to understand what is the weather doing right now so that we can predict with far greater accuracy what it will be tomorrow or next week or in two weeks time. It really got us very, very excited because climate change is one of the generational challenges that we face. Wow. And I do believe that space can play a phenomenally important role in tackling this challenge, but also the general challenge of, you know, using uh, uh, resources sustainably, right, and having a, a smart growth across the planet. And for us at Spire, weather is, is the one element where we really believe that we can make uh, a difference. And, you know, if we, if we do well, maybe can follow uh, Steve Jobs' advice and make a, a tiny little dent in the universe. With weather, are you selling the data to um, like companies that focus on weather that then pass that on to customers? Or is this information that individual customers um, want to take on for themselves? That's an excellent question, Rachel. And if you, if you maybe recall, Spire has this multiple layers of our solution. You know, it always starts with clean data Right, which is basically the raw information, clean, structured, and organized, and then made available through the API. And then it's smart data where it's fused with you know, third-party uh, uh, data and our analytics. And then it is uh, uh, predictive solutions at, at, at the next layer. So weather for us operates exactly the same way. We sell the clean data to generally government institutions that use the raw data to create weather predictions and other products, but it uh, uh, might also go to, to commercial uh, customers. And then we also do the, the predictive solutions, 
Like we run a, a supercompute center, um, uh, a few thousand cores that is just using this data uh, to drive weather prediction solutions that we then uh, make available to our customers as a subscription to our API. So we, we sell to different types of customers, governments, um, uh, commercial entities, generally civil governments, but sometimes also defense, um, are all of those, of those layers of solutions in the weather space, just as we do in the other spaces. Gotcha. And then um, space or satellite as a service, I know is another aspect of Spire. And so for people that might not be familiar with this model, how does it work and how does it work for customers of Spire? So anyone who has ever used uh, a cloud instance um, at, let's say, Amazon AWS knows actually exactly how Space as a Service with Spire works. Because we could give you an API to something in space the same way as you get an API to a cloud computer. So we have taken our infrastructure, it is like, um, uh, one of the most intense infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier, uh, very, very high cadence of operations, very, very stable, very, very reliable. And we just let customers rent that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And they can deploy code, or they could, in our case, also deploy a piece of hardware if they wanted to into that infrastructure but they don't need to know anything about space. They need to know about paternians and, and licenses and launch and power budgets and link, none of that. The same way as I don't need to know anything about air condition and power distribution and fault saves and, and, and universal power supplies for a data center, because I just log into my EC2 instance and off I go. So customers get um, the full utilization of a large deployed space infrastructure to run their own application, their own businesses with great certainty and reliability without needing to know any of the difficulty that makes space as unique as it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing more about this business model from a number of companies and I'm curious, is this kind of like the next wave? Whereas before, if you wanted to do something in space, you had to do it yourself and put that infrastructure in space. And now you can, you know, rent or just be a part of infrastructure like Spires that's already there. I think you're right, Rachel. If you think about, uh, again, coming back to that great analog to what is happening here, mainframe personal computers, um, early on, um, companies that wanted to start some form of internet or e-commerce business, well, the first $10 million of the venture capital money that went to Cisco because they had to buy mm -hmm. routers and, and, yeah. and, and computers and build the data center. And they spent the money and understand how to set up this technology long before they could do anything about the business model. They yeah. could do anything you know, about reaching a customer. And the proliferation of brilliant ideas leveraging this new technology, this new capability, personal computers, and now we carry it on our mobile phones, happened when uh, computing as a service, storage as a service became widely available, right? Because now companies don't spend their first $10 million on, uh, on Cisco and, and other kind of companies building a data center. They spend probably nothing because their VC gives them a $50,000 know, um, a grant uh, that one of the cloud computing providers gives them. And they can start deploying their application and reaching customers almost from day one. And that's the same thing that is happening in space. And yeah. I think um, as more providers that actually have scale, right? I mean, there is a reason why, you know, you can buy a, a computer from Lenovo or from Dell, but you wouldn't really use them as your cloud service provider when you start your startup. Right? You rely on companies that are using that infrastructure to run their own business on it. Like if you go to mm -hmm. Amazon, you know that there is a $2 trillion company using that very same infrastructure 
that you get to use. And I think the same is true for Spire. I mean, like we serve some of the most demanding customers in the world, US Air Force, NOAA, NASA, you know, Maersk, um, from that infrastructure. And I think that is what customers will want. They want the certainty that, you know, I, I, I want to buy parts from you. I want to buy a service that I know um, you have every incentive in the world to make perfect because all your business relies on that very same infrastructure. And so I think you're going to start to yeah. see um, uh, people that can you know, credibly create that trust with customers based on the scale of their operation, helping new ideas develop faster and cheaper um, of leveraging space to solve problems on Earth. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, kind of a broad question as you're, we're wrapping up, but what is something that you are most proud of, of Spire as the company has developed? You know, I, I would have to go to, to the people that I get to work with every single day. Um, that's, that's the thing that gets me excited every single day. Um, uh, it gets me excited, uh, to bring new people into the company. Uh, we've uh, we've been very very active there. You know, we used uh, um, uh, recently a number of our of our you know uh, communications with the press to to share some really really serious um, uh, senior people that we brought into the company. I think we have close to a hundred open positions across the planet. Oh, wow. And being able to connect with people that you feel have an alignment in culture in values to build something meaningful using space to make you know earth better sustainable growth climate change you know that's just something that connects you with a tribe so to speak yeah. that is um, a, a greater sense of belonging than just the same email address it's people that share more with each other than just getting the paycheck from the same company and that is the greatest privilege that that I could I could hope for and ask for. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Um, we like to wrap up with kind of a with like a recommendation question. So, what's something that you have been watching or listening to or reading lately that you're excited about and you could recommend to Via's readers, viewers? <laughs> <laughs> um, what 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 should I what what should I pick? Um, uh, the thing that I'm uh, of course reading a lot about is is like the uh, um, the toll that being isolated at home has mm -hmm. taken on 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 many people. And what I'm excited about there is that talking about about mental health is becoming um, uh, more and more commonplace the same way we talk about you know let's say diabetes or obesity or other, other kind of health problems, a heart disease right um it's the same thing and it um uh, and it ails you know similar numbers of people and i think that's a very very positive thing that i take uh, from that i think it also uh, brought us back to like that root that we are humans we are social beings that derive um, a great amount of um, benefit of like happiness when we are in actual physical proximity with people. And it's just 3 million years of evolution that allow our bodies to release things like oxytocin and endorphins when we are in physical proximity with people. And our bodies have a really hard time producing that same chemical response when we are on a Zoom call. And I think that touch point to like the humanity in all of us, and that despite all the excitement about technology and space and AI, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's all about people and the connection that we have to people. And for me, that is just a wonderful narrative um, that I definitely have been reading a lot about um, mm -hmm. And it definitely has a lot of meaning for me personally. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, I know for me being here in the US, our vaccinations have been 
we've had a strong rollout. So being able to spend time with friends and family over the last few months has just been so great after, you know, it was such a challenging year before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Um, we will continue to watch Spire and see your developments over the next few months. And congrats again on making Via's 10 hottest companies. And thanks for joining for this Thursday morning conversation. My pleasure, Rachel. Thank you so much.